winter or even the rest of the semester that's happening right now, potentially have it all figured out. And so uh, thank you for positively engaging, for giving um, professional feedback if that is welcomed. And I think what we'll do is I'll monitor the chat. If there's anything pressing while they're sharing for about eight to 10 minutes, we'll have them maybe take those questions um, as time allows, looking at a kind of 10 or 11 minute um, cap for each person and then we'll go back at the end to any questions that we weren't able to make it to um, and be sure that we can answer as many of those as possible within the hour. I hope that sounds okay. Uh, I'm seeing a little bit of nodding and so what I would like to do right now is pass the floor to Paula Gardner to share a bit about the Through Their Eyes project. Thanks Paula. Great. Hi everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay. I'm going to share my screen. I just pulled together a few slides. Um, I really appreciate that Sandy mentioned this was a work in progress because this is a big work in progress. I'm right at the beginning. In fact, I'm pinch hitting for somebody that they wanted to have here today and um, I like stepped up. So here we go. Let me just see, share my screen. Mm. Will it let me do it from here? Mm, one more, one more, please. So this is really good because I'm trying to figure out how to do this from here. Does anybody know share screen? So Paula, uh, you press the little uh, square with the arrow going up, right? Yeah. And then you just have to pick whichever one it is that you would like to share. If it's not there, then you might have to go to your browser. Uh, no, this is online. This is somebody else's. <laughs> uh, yeah, see, that was somebody else's. Uh, should it, I just want to share my desktop? Hmm. Uh. Okay, hang on. We'll figure it out. Yeah, if you don't, then um, I can just call in Mark and I'm sure he can help us. Okay, hang on. Well, look at um, this is really great because this is one of the things we're going to have to do. Let's see if this works. It's uploading now. So it looks like when I went to do it, I wanted some permission to put in these other um, uh, PowerPoints, but then I went to like upload from my own computer and there, there we go. Can everyone see okay? Okay, perfect. Okay, sorry about that. So this is uh, a course called Developing Healthy Communities. You know when you have a course that you feel like just everything works, it's super impactful. Everybody loves it and it's just a pleasure to teach. This is this course for me. So I'm in the Department of Health Sciences. This is a course where students in public health, um, we spend the semester learning about what makes a healthy community and how we can support that. The project, the main project for this class is called Through Their Eyes. And I've been doing this project for six years now and it's an intergenerational service learning project where seniors in the community are partnered with our students at Brock and together as research teams, they explore what makes uh, an age-friendly community in, in the neighborhood in which they're working. So they look at what, what's age-friendly, what's not, and changes that we can make. That's the big project. My community partner for this is Niagara Regional Housing. Sandy, you see that picture of you? This was a while ago. Um, so this is, uh, this is a project where I, I need community partners. So I've been partnering with Ni Niagara Regional Housing for about seven years. And what they do for me, besides being super supportive and encouraging, is they help me to identify or they identify a residence that they direct um, that's a senior's residence. And then they also help with recruitment and they also help put on um, a big community forum at the end. So that's my community partner. I'm going to highlight what I think are the key experiential learning um, activities that happen because I'm really gonna ask you 
after this to help me figure out how to take this class online. So one of the things we do that's really kind of central to this class is we spend three hours, one, one whole class, um, doing a aging simulation. So in addition to readings, in addition to lectures, in addition to a reflection journal that students keep for the semester, we do this um, experiential activity. I bring in walkers and canes and we spend a lot of time talking about disability and what happens to our bodies as we get older and some of the challenges that older people face. And then students go out into the, the Brock campus and uh, perform activities that they would do like putting on shoes and trying to read a newspaper or walk slowly with a cane. And this activity students have told me over and over is super impactful and really important to preparing them to going out into the community. Then they conduct in field research. So this is a Brock uh, REB approved research study. So we collect data and we're, we've been collecting that data and using that data for publications. So this is a research study. The first interview, the students go out uh, and interview the seniors in their home. And this is really about building trust and rapport and getting to know each other and their pets and dogs. And um, this is about seeing how long they've lived in the neighborhood and um, sort of a icebreaker at first. The second interviews are moving interviews. So this is where the students and older adults go right, go into the neighborhood. The older adults um, are their tour guides. And together they have these beautiful conversations about uh, where they go in the neighborhood, what are their, their kind of hot spots that they like to go to, any challenges that they might have in the neighborhood. And uh, the students collect all this data, including photographs and audio recordings. At the end of the semester, we have a community forum where we go into the seniors residence, all the students, um, attend this event. It's usually like a super lot of fun. There's lots of tears and hugging and um, we present what our preliminary findings from our research and um, students and seniors get up and share some of their reflections um, about what they learned from the project and what they enjoyed and it's um, it's I can't tell you how uh, powerful this uh, this experience is in terms of the course. So now we come to our announcement on fall this semester everything's going online or particularly undergrad classes um, I should let you know I have about 40 students in this class usually my instinct right away when I heard this was to switch this course to this to the winter semester because of the field research piece and I just couldn't at first sort of imagine what this might look like uh, online or not in person. But then, and then here's my first sort of tip is call your community partner or because when I called her to talk about this, um, it became very clear that it's actually needed now more than ever. The, these older adults in these residences, they're super worried about them. They're really isolated and um, they're really needing some connection right away. And the fall would be ideal. So here's the challenge. How do we take this experience, this course, this project online and still make it meaningful? for everybody and as you can see there's this human connection and interaction from this photograph is um, that's what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about how to do this. In terms of the critical pieces there's that aging simulation and again I'm just going to sort of tell you where I'm at with this and then open it up and hopefully you can help me with this. Um, I think that students could still do this at home. We could, I could send like a, here's, here's the activity sheet. Here's some of the materials you might need to gather. Um, and we could, students could try it at home and then we could come back together either in small groups or eventually together and reflect on what that experience was like. So I feel like that's something we could do. In terms of the interviews, these older adults, most of them use the telephone for communication and students are petrified of calling People. So we'd, we'd have to do a little bit of work <laughs> to get um, the students uh, um, prepared to actually make phone calls and do some of these interviews online. But I feel like the first one could be done over the telephone. 
The second one would be trickier. So I'm st we're still thinking about that. Any feedback would be helpful. And then this community forum, trying to take something online in a Zoom or Teams format like this when a lot of the older adults still don't have access to the full access to computers and laptops and Zoom and Teams m is a challenge. So that's where I'm at. I'm just going to end my talk here, my little. And um, this is what I'm saying that I need your help. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paula. I see Don Zinga's hand just went up. Go ahead, Don. I'm just going to try and turn off my computer here. I think I have everything on now. So I was, <clears throat> I agree with you. You could do the age simulation at home or even um, giving them some more online work to do around it. And the the home interview. So the the neighborhood. I doubt COVID is going to cooperate in the way that we might like, so that that would be possible. But I'm wondering if you could do a separate. So if the home interview stays um, the way it is, just done by phone, could you do the neighborhood instead of the neighborhood, the impacts of COVID and what kind of supports that they need? So. What have they experienced so far? What are they finding as barriers? And then what could people do to either remove some of those barriers or to make this isolation better? Because I agree with you. They're more isolated than ever. At a time when they need so much more social stimulation than they're able to get with the programming shutdown. So even just having those two interviews, if they have to be on phone, if um, the is it one home that you work with or is it multiple? Usually it's one residence. Now this is where this was wide open because it doesn't, we don't have to be tied to one residence, but usually we do it with one because we're really interested in the neighborhood impact. But I like what you're suggesting here about, and I think taking advantage of what's happening because we could see, we could also still do a neighborhood level examination or exploration by asking, you know, were, did things come in from the neighborhood? You know, was the neighborhood or the housing supportive during this or, you know, what's been great about it as well as what's been challenging? So thank you. Yeah, even if they could look at things that they would like the neighborhood to do and there could be some reach out, like if they want, I mean, people go for their neighborhood walks. Would it be helpful if when they walked by the home, they had signs that say, you know, we're thinking about you, hope you're doing well, like something? Yeah, great ideas. And I think that would allow you to shift it and still make it meaningful in this context. Wonderful. Elise Lapano, your hand is up as well. And I think this might be able to be the, this might be the last um, kind of live question or comment. Um, if you don't mind typing the rest in the chat specifically to Paula, she can pick the feedback up later. And I do see some great comments in there. Go ahead, Elise. Sure. So I was just looking um, at your, your process. So you have the aging simulation first and then the home interview. So I'm thinking um, perhaps instead of having the students do the aging simulations at home on their own, what might be uh, a more authentic experience could be um, interviewing the uh, seniors in a more phenomenological way so that they have a more authentic lived experience of the individuals. Um, in terms of what has their what have their challenges been um, or um, what have they found the most difficult about transition into maybe their senior years and then gather that information um, and then that also might act as um, a more it would lay the groundwork maybe for some of the other questions you're asking during the home interview and there would be that already established connection because their first interview is asking more in-depth questions about um, what what the seniors experience has been and them really engaging with them and wanting to know more super ideas thank you so much and thanks for everybody and any other suggestions please put them in the chat or email me um, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for the opportunity. Amazing. Thank you so much, Paula. And even just for opening it up to ideas from this group, I think there's plenty of people happy to help. Uh, I'm also realizing that I went out of my own suggested order. 
so at this point, we're going to turn it over to Tom Brown from Interactive Arts and Sciences to share about his internship. Thanks, Tom. Well, thanks, Andy, for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Oh, I just want to make sure my computer's working. OK, I think we're good. Um, so yeah, I'm part of the Center of Digital Humanities. Uh, I'm currently teaching one of our classes, uh, ISC 3P95, which is specifically our internship and placement class. Now, normally, because this is uh, with our external partners at Brock, it is most of the time I don't get to see the students. But the one thing that's different, especially this summer that we're doing this, uh, prior than other terms is usually the students are still around and I can see the students and if there's an issue or anything I can immediately look at that student and be hey uh, you know where's your worksheet where's your homework where's your hours anything along those lines so coming up to this summer because I don't have that opportunity uh, communication is probably one of the key things to get down with those specific students um, so I have my notes on the side here and the screen just went black um, but that is one of the key important things that I think is important with dealing with externals. It's important for the students and the hosts to make sure they communicate properly. It's important for me and the students and for me and the hosts to make sure we all talk in that kind of form or way. Um, and making sure that we understand what that communication channel specifically is. I know with my students and the hosts, it's email, but it's not all students uh, work with email. One of my students actually communicates purely on Teams in that case because it's a preferred communication method. Um, it's also depending on what times we communicate in. I, I know I, with my syllabus, we all have office hours or anything form of that case, but I also have a response time where if they have an issue, they can email me and then I can get back to them within about 24 hours or something along those lines. And especially now that we don't have any face to face, uh, it's way more important to be that concise and I think also uh, because I don't have slides, I decided to go to the slide list because um, it's easier to see even with this video that I have like certain cadences or certain ways of moving my hands to kind of get certain points across. Uh, if I were to even just eliminate the webcam, for example, just for a moment in time, you, you might still hear the cadences on my voice, but it's much harder to figure out what I'm communicating with, what I'm talking about, where I'm specifically pointing to. Um, and that comes across really hard with text. Uh, so having that kind of communication channel is important but also fairly concise and the way information is transferred is also incredibly important uh, which comes across a lot of the pitfalls i had with my structure previously uh, before the the summer term happened uh, than it is now um, because even though i was just communicating with emails with the students i didn't have a really good resource for having them have um, information like we have a website on the cdh with all the the syllabus and all the documents um, but a lot of the submissions were done through like assignments uh through email uh their grades were sent through email um, it was really hard for the students to actually like kind of collate all that information uh, i'd have to do it in my own document system they'd have to do it like on their own time um, so one of the things that i decided to use uh, is Sakai on that case. Uh, Sakai wasn't really an option that I thought about beforehand, but it kind of came in to save that kind of information. So they have one place they can look for, for all that information, for the announcements, um, for the documents, uh, so they don't have to look uh, for that CDH page, but they can actually look on Sakai. And it's easier for them to submit assignments and for grades on that case. Uh, so kind of collating that um, communication piece with all the information found in that case makes things a lot easier. Uh, I still check in with the students from time to time through email uh, about once a month uh, just to see kind of how things are working with it. Uh, but that's kind of, I technically check in with them once a, once a week, but indirectly. One of the things that we do for this class is an hours tracker. And this could be just another, it's another form of communication, but something not known to the student, because one of the things we don't want to do is drown them with over communication. We don't want to email them three times a week and be like, how's, how's the internship? How's the internship? Um, it's, you're just going to get drowned out with the noise, especially with all the different information that's currently cycling through on their email potentially. Um, so having just a small forms of information like communication through them and making sure you still gather information, even maybe indirectly. So back to the hours tracker. Um, the students update their hours by each session that they do. They might do this per the week. They might do this every session. Uh, but just by looking at this once a week, I can tell that they're updating their hours tracker, that things are going well, what specific tasks they're working on. And actually, I just checked it today. One of the students didn't fill it out last week. 
uh, it tells me how if they're behind or not. Because one of the things we have to be is even though this uh, is external, we have to be proactive in talking with the students and being with the students. And if we're not, you know, seeing them face to face or communicating with them like all the time, it's harder on that case. So this hour tracker allowed me to make sure they're on top of things uh, without asking them all the time about the, like how things are going on that case. So there is definitely like different ways of communication that we can have for the students on that case. Um, and if as long as we're clear and concise with that kind of information, it is incredibly important. And with that ease of information traveling back and forth to the students, uh, it's easier for them to kind of understand what's going on. And if they have a question, it's easier to get back to you on that case. So in particular, it's just making sure that you have a form of communication that's clearly stated what that is and how that's going and making sure that all the information is like available with easy access. Uh, so it's not all over the place. You're using all these different channels. They're using like one tool, potentially Teams, potentially like Sakai, uh, will probably help the students more on that case. Oh, I guess I have one last point that I forgot to bring up actually. Um, the one thing this is, is it's fantastic for our hosts right now. A lot of the times we want them in office to kind of have that group environment. But the hosts are getting a lot of information, uh, not just for me, but also from experiential education, kind of, you know, get Sandy out there. Because uh, there was a document going around on how to do like communication while being within an internship has helped our hosts quite a bit. Um, so kind of having that uh, information has helped our hosts, but also some of our hosts that haven't been able to offer uh, interns because they don't have a uh, specific location now has that opportunity while going online. Also, this helped hosts that may have lost an office or don't need an office space currently now do some sort of online internship in some form of way. So communicating with our hosts and having that um, channel open allows us to actually branch out to more of our hosts than we've ever had possible. Uh, this one's a little bit smaller just because everything happened when they were registering for classes, but this is a great opportunity for hosts and students to kind of interact in more of a digital environment on that case. So, yeah, I might have went through that one a little quickly, <laughs> um, but that's uh, what I have. It's focusing mostly on communication. And, and now thank I see some things in the chat, so. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing, Tom. I think one of the challenges that we certainly hit experience uh, across the board with students out on internships is that once they're gone, they're really hard to get a hold of. And it can take a lot of following up um, to get students to report back to hand in forms and, and paperwork, uh, potentially not so much assignments because it's connected to a grade, but all those other pieces of the process. So thanks so much for sharing what you've learned uh, in that sense. Are there any questions for Tom at this particular time? I'm okay you with that. You may have just covered it for, <laughs> because I know that I was taking some really quick notes about uh, recommendations that we can make to other areas on campus that host internships as well. So I just want to personally say thank you so much for that. Are you planning on staying on the line? Yeah, I'll be on the line the entire time. So if anyone okay, great. A question if at anything the end. hits anyone after the fact, uh, we can connect back with Tom or any of our presenters at the end. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. At this time, I will turn it over to Mike Ripmeister, who comes to us from our Department of Geography and is currently teaching a field course where students would typically travel to Vancouver uh, in the online format. Thanks so much, Mike. Go ahead. Well, thanks very much. And thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, we would have been finishing up the course in Vancouver today, in fact. Um, and we had uh, 22 students who were ready to go. We had the accommodations, everything was done. And then it got pulled out from under us. Um, and some of the students needed the course to graduate. So um, by whatever reason, we decided to try put this online. It hasn't been easy. It's not um, an easy thing to take a sort of full body sensual experience like walking through a city and put it online um but we well i'm trying so um what we would normally do in the course is is walk around the city we'd stop in various places and talk about whether it be rent gap rent gap or cruise ships or um pedestrian street malls and the students would go and look 
they would we would ask them to design little projects and then do them and report back and have discussions. Um, field books were an important part of this where students were supposed to record what they were seeing, but also reflect on the kinds of things that they were doing, compare them to what they knew, um, ask questions, think about questions that they might ask, um, think about how they could imagine things being different. Um, we would also then ask them to write a final paper and at the end of the term they would write a paper not so much on Vancouver or Chicago or wherever the field course was but to think about experiential education so the thing that they would do would be to write a lit review on experiential education and then use their field notes as a way of giving evidence giving examples of how being in the field worked for them or didn't work for them. Um, so this was this was an important thing um, in the way that students sort of picked up why it was important to be on in the field. The problem is, of course, how to transfer this onto online. Um, there are certain things you just can't do. You can't smell the, the ocean. You can't smell the tar on the street. You can't feel your legs get heavy from walking up steep hills and all those other kinds of things. So um, I did have um, access to things like Google Earth Studio and Google Earth Pro, which allowed you to do at least visuals. Um, there are drawbacks to both of these things. Um, Google Earth Studio is fantastic for moving around a city and a lot of the imagery is in 3D. So you can do some really nice movement across city. You can't get too close because the resolution falls apart. Um, trees and buildings start to look like they were cut out by five year olds um, rather than anything close to reality. Um, you can get nice street screen scene stuff from Google Earth Pro, but you're limited to largely um, panorama things. The um, learning curve for this was absolutely tremendous. Um, it took me a long, 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 long time to work out how these things might work. Um, but as far as that goes, that's OK. The tougher part was the experiential part. So the students watch the lectures, um, which are mostly visual. Um, they do have to keep a field notebook, and I ask them to do exactly the same things in their field notebooks um, now that they would have done if they were in Vancouver. So they take notes. Um, instead of taking pictures, they take screenshots. Um, they're encouraged to go off and explore for themselves, whether using sort of a geospatial forum or just searching the internet. Um, but they're supposed to do this every day and keep tabs of what they're thinking, what they're learning and how they're learning. Um, the paper that they're right to write is almost exactly the same as I would have done in the field where they're again using their field notebooks to reflect on experiential education and how a course like this might have helped them. Um, participation is a huge challenge. Um, we've got students all over the country, um, so I decided to go asynchronous rather than synchronous uh, just because it was hard to get people together. And in the end, and because of the time frame for this, um, we had the I think the approval to run this course in April. So I had only a few weeks to put it together and I just couldn't figure out a good way to make participation work. So I gave up on it. Um, and instead, I tried to find another way for students to get a sense of what things were like um, in the neighborhoods, in the areas that we were looking at. So I assigned for each stop that we made um, using Sakai, uh, a lesson where they would have to go and read newspapers and sort of sort out newspapers by themes and then follow themes and write a short reflection on what they were thinking about the particular theme they found in the newspaper. And they were to think about stakeholders, they were to think about what's missing, they were to think about what kind of truth statements were being made. Um, and I think from the response so far that this is pretty positive. Now um, the course is over. I'm, I'm well. This is the last week of it, and um, the advice that I can offer is to keep things short. Um, my finished lectures range from five minutes to about thirty minutes. 
um, the files get really, really, really large fast if you're using any kind of video um, or moving images. Um, this can create problems for both you and your students um, uploading and downloading. I lost a lecture somewhere in the internet. I don't know where it went. Um, I would recommend using a um, high powered computer if you can find one. I just got a new MacBook Pro to do this very course and it is even sometimes struggling to keep up. Um, I worried a lot about the quality of the lectures at the beginning. Um, and I guess what I've come to is if it doesn't seem like a David Attenborough narrated, narrated documentary, don't worry about it. Um, it's still coming across and the feedback that I get from students is they don't seem to mind if I'm stumbling over words or if there's a technical difficulty. Um, the other thing is that um, accessibility is also a question. Um, I have a couple of students who have, um, they're registered with OASIS. And so um, I would recommend like getting the latest uh, version of PowerPoint from ITS. It automatically subtitles and it automatically loads um, to OneDrive. So that can save you a fair bit of questions. Um, and then the other thing is during the content, I ask for a reflection, even though I know they're not listening to it while I speak for it. But you know, if we see something, I ask them to notice and to think about what they're seeing. And then, um, like Tom said, uh, being in contact with the students is fairly important. I use a chat room, so even though it's not synchronous, we can still talk. Um, and I do email them, I ask for feedback, I ask about workload management and um, to see how things are going. And, and the students seem to appreciate that a fair bit. OK, I, I think that's about it. Fantastic, thank you so much, Mike. Um, one of the things that I know I've been thinking a lot about, and you touched on it here, is not only how the experience shifts, but what happens when you can't use your senses in the same way in the field? Yeah. And how does that connect to reflective practice, right? There's a huge, huge impact there. Um, and I think even some of the reflective questions that you asked your students, you know, what questions would you have asked if you were there? It's forming a different relationship than uh, what Paula's students can and can't form with seniors and what Tom's students can and can't form in the workplace. Uh, yeah. You know, it's with a, a city and all the aspects of community that kind of ripple out from there. Absolutely. Um, it's it's like questions when you know you talk about walkability. It's one thing to watch a video of, a, of, of somebody going up a hill, but it's another thing to walk it on a hot day and to talk about what it might mean to if you walk it on on it when it's icy, right? Um, you're exactly right. Um, and you know what does you can't talk about heat or you know traveling on foot. One of the things that uh, one of the students talked about after the last um, course that we ran in Vancouver in 2018. She said, you shouldn't call this a course. It's more of a boot camp because we're constantly walking up and down hills. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And also sharing a little bit about um, the technological side of this, right? And this is one of the pieces that I think we're all thinking about is how do we make that shift from face to face and what technology is best? Uh, and so I appreciate your insights there. Are there any questions at this point directly for Mike? Wonderful. Well, we'll see if any pop up towards the end. Thank you so much for sharing. No and our last speaker today, last but certainly not least, is Tiffany Gallagher from our Faculty of Education, and she uh, facilitates activities in the learning lab there, including doing some tutoring with children and youth. And she's going to talk about that being taken online and all the complexities that come with that. So thank you so much, uh, Tiffany. I know you've had a back to back day. Thanks for hopping on and being with us. And I'll pass the mic over to you. Are you OK sharing your own slides? I think so. Can you see them? Can you confirm? Yes, we can. You're all good. Excellent. OK. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I feel like I'm just um, I'm just out of the uh, woods in terms of our course just ended and I just finished all my grading on the weekend and our experiential component also was complete as of Thursday. So it's hot off the press, <laughs> in other words. Um, 
you had asked for a few different talking points, and I want to first give a little bit of context about the course. This course is a third year concurrent education course, and it's called Reading and Literacy Development. It runs in the fall, winter and spring. The experiential component is one-on-one um, -on -one tutoring that's given to um, students or children in our community. And that would be students kindergarten through grade 11 or 12. And these third year uh, students are taking a course that focuses on reading assessment and uh, reading development, and in particular intervention strategies for those readers who are struggling. We also have um, placements in school. So the, the students taking this course can opt to do their tutoring either in a school setting, and that would be within either of the school boards where they go to that site and they tutor for one hour, or they can tutor at the Brock Learning Lab. And those tutoring sessions would be in the evening hours after school hours. And the Brock Learning Lab is situated in the Brock Research and Innovation Center on Lockhart Drive, just below the escarpment. So it's a location where parents can bring the child, drop them off, have the one hour of tutoring and then come back for that. Um, so this course uh, was facilitated 100% um, online in the spring term. And what was most exciting is all the tutoring was done one-on-one uh, -on -one online as well this, this semester. So we very quickly had to put together um, an online or a virtual um, experiential component. Um, actually moving the course online was, was much easier than doing the experiential piece online. So I'll share with you a few ideas, best practices. Um, well, for the course, we did some synchronous and some asynchronous classes for the weekly um, content. Um, the synchronous component, um, the experiential component, was eight one-hour tutoring sessions. So within that five-week duration of the spring course, uh, tutors had to tutor um, eight one-hour sessions. But what was really important was they had to be available 15 minutes before their tutoring time and 15 minutes after for um, what we call prep prior to your experience and then debriefing afterwards. So that was done by either myself as an instructor and I also had two co-instructors who are uh, staff at the Brock Learning Lab and supervisors. It was really important for us to have something we called um, real-time digital communication space. Um, and by that we had sort of this, this place, it was also used as a repository where both the student could, um, could access resources, but the instructor or the supervisor could also upload resources. And we could also share communication around how the, um, the client or the, the, the child being tutored was, was doing. We had uh, culminating tasks that were all uh, obviously digital. We had a digital journal where they reflected on their experience with the client in light of our course readings on reflection. There were uh, discussion boards where they posted reflections on readings. And we also required an end of session, a letter report that went to the family based on the experience. And as far as transition to the online environment, um, we use Sakai heavily, the chat room in particular, for what we called common problems of practice. These were non-confidential questions about the practicum experience where they could post and often their, their peers had the same sorts of questions. Um, we had an online accountability uh, set of tasks. So for each of the weeks um, or the modules as we called them, to enhance the asynchronous content, we had students do activities or go on to the forums and do discussions and upload artifacts of what they were actually engaging in with their, with their client. We had a really good discussion with them around online professionalism, um, citing that they're representing Brock, the Faculty of Education, they're training to be teachers, but we also talked about things like when you're online, you have to speak slowly and clearly. You should be using hand gestures. You want to keep the attention of the child that you're working with. And that technology lags, so you need to be patient with that. 
we also recognized that we had to give very timely feedback and communication um, as instructors. We had online drop-in office hours, and we had to be really, really flexible as instructors moving online to say that we can only do so many tasks um, and we have to uh, engage in those that we are feeling competent in. The challenges, I think the number one thing we learned is that we have a hard time controlling the clients or the community members technology knowledge and their skills and their connectivity and their bandwidth and their devices and the list goes on and on. Uh, the community member almost needs some sort of a tech tutorial and we highly recommend that as an institution that we start to think about um, an IT liaison person someone who can help community members if a Brock representative or a Brock student is connecting with them to ensure that they have what they need on their end. Because it was very frustrating in some cases for families to make sure that they had what they needed. Um, there were apprehensions on both parts actually. Our undergraduate students were apprehensive about doing their experiential learning online and certainly their, our clients and community members had initial apprehensions. We also worked really hard to have all of the legal agreements in place related to privacy, confidentiality, duty to report in an online um, experiential component. Um, and that actually went both ways. So we had um, sign off by both the community members as well as our Brock students. We also did require police record checks. And just staying on top of all of the coursework and experiential supervision in a timely manner is really challenging when you when you move online. Um, I have actually pictures of myself supervising multiple sessions of tutoring and it required five devices. So I had five different tablets and laptops all running simultaneously while I was popping in and out of each of the sessions to listen to um, how things were going. The technology we used, um, we learned very quickly that we needed to actually be um, deploying both MS Teams and Life Size as video conferencing tools for the experiences of the students. And you might wonder why? Well, it's a mystery because some community members could easily access Teams and others could only access Life Size. So we had to have those rooms set up or those meetings set up in both platforms at the same time so that we could quickly move between the two. Um, we also realized that we needed a platform that we could have our Brock students sharing with the community members that wasn't in the Brock ecosystem. So we had to move to things like Google Jamboard in some cases. We also needed to build in time at the beginning of the course for our Brock students to do a dress rehearsal, as we called it, so that they could understand how to use um, MS Teams and life size. So for example, sharing screen and different features and so on. And we always had a backup plan. So we had makeup appointments in case the Wi-Fi went down. In one case, a family lost all power to their home and we had alternative ways of communicating with family members when communications got lost. So by email or text message. And that concludes my sort of synopsis of what we've learned this semester so far. Any questions or? I don't see any hands raised. Are there any questions floating out there for Tiffany or at this point uh, for any of our presenters at all? Paula, Tom, Mike and Tiffany are all still with us. Yes, I echo that great presentations. It's amazing to see courses in different stages of design uh, with a lot of philosophies being talked about in the chat. You know, if we wait until things are perfect, we might never try. And so where are we comfortable uh, just launching from and tweaking from there? A uh, question here for you, Tiffany, about can you share a bit with the group about the consent process? I know that was something that uh, took a considerable amount of time. Yes. Uh, wow. Um, so first of all, I want to thank everyone who sort of shared in the consultation process. I know Carolyn and Sandy, you both looked at some of our agreements. 
Um, we actually took our lead from our professional organization. So we were fortunate as sort of a, a faculty of education to have a little bit of a precedence with respect to the Ontario College of Teachers. But everything was so new for them as well, because as you all know, um, teachers have been teaching via distance as well. That would be elementary and secondary teachers. And the Ontario College of Teachers didn't have policies in place for this. So um, they were coming out with, uh, I guess, directives and statements very, very rapidly too. So we were able to sort of extract some of that um, and put together what we felt was appropriate and then have that vetted by several individuals, including Brock, Brock's legal department. So I'm happy to share those as samples, but I really don't have any advice other than draw on your other professional organizations and whatever those protocols may or may not be. Thank you very much for that. Are there any questions uh, for any of the presenters at this point? There were some hands up earlier. I'm not sure if uh, those comments are still appropriate or lingering, feel free. Okay, well, I think at this point, in the interest of using everyone's time well, I would like to again thank Paula, Tom, Mike, and Tiffany for sharing today and for doing that uh, on quite short notice. Everything that you had to share was so different, so interesting, and I certainly have a couple of pages of notes and ideas. Um, thank you everyone as well for providing your feedback. Um, and for your thoughtful questions. There was a lot going on in the, on the side in the chat, including um, a book I'd like to highlight called On Looking that Paula was typing a bit about. And I know a few people who have read this and you basically go on a walk around the block, but through a different lens each time. And so when we're asking students to do reflection, it is a really great um, piece on perspective and how do you incorporate multiple perspectives or recognize that there are others. Uh, thank you so much for all those comments. Um, I've certainly been thinking a lot about reflective practice, how you do that when, like you said, Mike, you can't walk up the hill while it's icy um, and you can't have some of those direct experiences, but also how do you build close relationships um, through technology, you know, and what is the technology? Madeline and I have been talking a little bit about uh, a potential future session that really breaks this down into what are your learning outcomes? What are your experiential learning activities, knowing that it doesn't have to be anything robust, right? You don't have to jump straight into the deep end, but start small, um, get something that you're comfortable with um, and move forward from there. What are the assessments, but also what are the appropriate technologies to mobilize this in the best possible way, knowing that it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, but what gives you the best vehicle to try something? And so we might uh, look at putting put some putting something in a few weeks from now, a little bit more in depth around that topic and kind of taking a course along that particular continuum. I had mentioned earlier that our session coming up, our next one on June 22nd, will be a panel with community partners. So if you're on this call as someone who's been sharing or as a participant and you have a community partner in mind, who would really like to share with us what would make experiential learning easier for them and provide that community perspective. We are looking for a few different types of partners from across the institution. Feel free to um, send them directly to me, you know, do an e-introduction. Uh, my contact information I can put in the chat uh, and it's also online. And uh, I also wanted to remind you that our teaching and learning innovation grants still have the experiential education bucket active. And what we've done is just shifted that bucket so that it still supports experiential learning that you're taking online. And so if you need some kind of learning tool, if you need an experiential support person, recognizing some of what goes into the building of these courses, um, the grants are intentionally kept short and also pretty broad so that you can ask for what it is that you need. And a committee will take a look at that and figure out whether or not uh, that's appropriate for us to fund up to $3,000 per course. You do need to talk a little bit about how you'll sustain that in the future, uh, whether or not you keep the course online or it returns to face to face. Thanks for the link, Madeline. That's great. Um, and just thinking about whether or not that would serve you is something that we're completely open to. We would love to remove the barriers for you on any front possible, knowing that this is time consuming work. 
Um, and that certainly making the transition to online isn't always simple or a very, very clear path. So please reach out to the experiential team or CPI at any point in time. And I think that's it. Have a great day, everyone. The registration for the June 22nd session will be on the CPI website. And if you do have feedback about other future topics that you'd like to unpack together around putting experiential learning online, um, please get those to me as well. We would love to keep this group going and the conversation going around doing this, leading all the way up to September and, and potentially beyond. So just let us know what it is that you'd like to chat about and we can do something about that. All right, happy Monday. Have a great week ahead of you. Enjoy the sunshine and we'll talk to you soon. Bye everybody.